Uh, but one thing that is obviously that you're you're a pioneer for things like DAT tape and things like uh, file-based recording. Right. Um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on where, well, firstly, what you think of the industry now in terms of technology and how that's it's playing more and more of a role and where you think that's kind of heading. Well, the, the first thing is, um, uh, and I'll speak about this primarily from the perspective of production sound recording, even though I'm very well versed in post. And unfortunately, when I started my career, there, was, um, there wasn't this huge division between production and post that there seems to be now. Um, and uh, for a variety of reasons, first of all, the crews were all smaller. Um, and uh, the, the technology, all the technology that was used in production and in post was much simpler. Um, there was not, um, uh, you know, nobody really talked about like the learning curve. There weren't words like workflow and, uh, um, you know, even things as simple as uh, sample rate and, uh, you know, time code and, you know, all those things which, which people now, obviously, those become sort of the most important things. Um, so that uh, when I started out, um, things were much, much simpler. And as long as you could master the, uh, the equipment, which was fairly easy because you had one recorder you would be using, which was an Agra. Um, you had one track you were dealing with because it was a mono, mono recorder. Um, and a selection of microphones, but not a lot of microphones. Uh, and, you know, uh, in the beginning of my career, there, would always, there was the possibility of using wireless mics but uh, there weren't any wireless mics that worked very well. Uh, you couldn't rely on them. If you, if you owned any of them, um, they would generally be on the truck. Uh, you'd bring them out for that one shot where you actually had to use the wireless. Um, and so, you know, we weren't concerned with things like frequency allocation and spectrum, you know, stuff, uh, because we weren't using any RF gear. Um, generally, things were done with a single microphone and a single camera. Uh, and the microphone would either be on a fishbowl or on a boom. And um, so the, the, the technology part of it was like really low tech, but it was also um, completely appropriate and completely up to the task of recording production sound because there wasn't any other department that all of a sudden says, well, can't we just, you know, uh, put two people in a car and drive away and have them do five pages of dialogue? Uh, and can you get that? Um, and, and by the way, um, you know, at Video Village, uh, the clients need to hear what they're saying. And then if you could send a feed to so-and-so, and then we want to make sure that we can sync the dailies up and we're putting those all up online. Uh, you know, none of that stuff happened, you know, so that um, it was actually very easy um, to focus on what I really focused on in the beginning, which was recording really good sound where the voices of the actors on the set, and primarily was dialogue recording, although on every movie there would be, um, you know, a fair amount of effects recording and stuff like that. I always felt like as long as I'm there and I have the recording technology, and I use the word technology very loosely because we're talking about a recorder and a microphone, um, uh, it would, uh, anything that I can record that can be useful for someone in post when they, when they go to put this all together, because we're not making the whole soundtrack on the day that we're shooting. Uh, we are very much responsible for the dialogue, for the actors' performances, um, and that would be our main our main focus. And um, the technical stuff just sort of worked itself out because um, all of the departments, you know, I mean, the director of photography understood that we're going to shoot a master. Uh, the director understood that we're going to shoot a master, which sort of gives us a good idea of the blocking and all that. But the performances in the master don't really matter because uh, we'll be going in for coverage uh, where we'll do the two shot and then we'll get to your single. And um, so, uh, but all those things sort of started to go out the door when it became economically feasible and easy to shoot multiple cameras. You know, in the old days, you would never shoot more than one camera unless you were like blowing up a car or something that was only going to happen once. For any dramatic narrative, you know, you're not shooting a sporting event. Um, you know, if you were shooting a scripted uh, piece, you would, it would almost always be laid out where you would shoot a master. Then you would break it up and you'd move into coverage. And one of the things that the production sound mixer had to, uh, had to know how to do was to be able to make sure that all those cuts would work. You know, because you may shoot you know, we may shoot the master in the morning, 
Um, and then uh, we won't get to you know the rest of the coverage until after lunch, and then you'll be doing so-and-so's close-up, and you may even be doing a shot that works with that scene on another day um, in another situation. So you had to make sure that all those things matched, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't make sure that they matched. You would make sure that they matched perfectly the image um, because in those days, you know, the, old, the good old days, um, we, used to, we used to sort of automatically have what's referred to now as perspective sound recording, which is the space around the voice. Um, uh, if, it, if it was a big shot and the person was far away, you know, in the shot, they would sound further away. Um, uh, and you could let that go because you were shooting with the one camera, it's just that one angle. Then when you moved in for the close-up, the microphone would move in because it could, um, but it wouldn't move all the way in. It would move into the point where I would know that it's going to cut nicely with um, the cutting pattern that's been revealed to us because we're either working with the director that we've worked with before, or we also understand that we're making something that adheres to sort of the traditional rules of, you know, if you're in the master, you're in the master pretty much for geography. Um, and all that. and you would never pop back to that master and um, so you make the sound appropriate for the uh, for the size of the shot um, again something which is lost when you're shooting multiple sizes you have multiple cameras you have one camera that's shooting essentially a master an all-inclusive shot you have another camera that's getting the two shot and then you may have a third camera that's getting this person's close-up well how can you preserve any perspective? You can't make three totally separate recordings so that, um, you know, to try and make it like in the good old days. So you end up having to put mics on people because the boom can't get into the right place for that close up. So perspective goes out the window. The perspective is the sound of that person microphone on their body. Now, people in post have also had to deal with this. Um, They've had to make sure that the scene doesn't sound like a radio show where you have the actors sort of narrating the scene that we see them in, um, which is the way it sounds if you literally just played all of those mics, you know, close with the perspective that they have. So, and there's certainly tricks that they can do in, in post to, to try and, but, but none of those tricks have ever really replicated what I feel I was able to do early on in my career. Um, with the placement of the microphone, with the understanding of the room that we might be in. And I feel that all of those things actually helped tell the story because it's not, it's not just having people understand the words that people are saying. It's being able to get all those nuances of how they're delivering the dialogue. It's actually capturing that performance. And it includes even simple things like, you know, mouth ticks and breathing and, um, inflection and stuff which tends to get lost if the microphone is you know on their body buried under their clothing and um, uh, and all sorts of stuff a lot of those nuances are gone and pretty much audiences have sort of accepted that loss because they don't know it's a loss in other words they don't know somebody watching an episodic TV show now doesn't really you know Certainly, if they're a young person, they probably have no reference to. Um, uh, I mean, I was struck by the fact that um, I don't watch that much TV, but my wife and I watch, um, you know, certain shows, and we've been watching this uh, Columbo um, marathon that's been going on. You know, old. You know, well, you know the Columbo series, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and my wife turned to me uh, one of the times we were watching. She says, "You know, this is one of the first shows on TV that we're watching now, where I've had no trouble understanding anybody." You know, all the dialogue has been very clear. Why is that? She's asking me. I'm the sound mixer. Um, yeah. So I explained to her that, first of all, they didn't shoot in locations that were impossible for sound. A lot of it was on sound stages. You were working with actors who knew how to speak, even though Peter Falk obviously has this characteristic Columbo delivery. He still knows how to enunciate. Um, it's not the uh, the modern actor that figures, you know, I'm – I don't want. I don't want to be too big. I don't want you know. Well, <laughs> somebody theater. has to hear it's you. you know? yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and um, you know, generally shot with one camera. Uh, you know, each shot was set up properly. They were in close-ups when you should be in close-ups. They weren't having to protect for the fact that there was some other camera that was shooting some ridiculously 
wide establishing shot, even while you're doing Peter Fox close up. You know, so it's. Um, um, I know I'm rambling a little bit, but the, the, the better answer to your question about the technology today is that has it's been, first of all, I think there's no one that would dispute that it's become much more complex. Uh, there are many, many more things that we have to worry about. You look at anybody's sound card, and again, I'll talk about primarily scripted narrative, you know, motion pictures, stuff like that, because that's generally the work that I've been doing, uh, you know, certainly for the last 20 or 30 years, even though I've done probably, you know, 20 documentaries, I've done hundreds of commercials, I, I've been in those worlds, but, you know, in, in recent recent history, it's been primarily feature films. Um, you look at anybody's sound card, the sound cards of uh, the mixers that are doing episodic television, you know, and they'll have, you know, sometimes two or three recorders, they'll have a, a, a bank of wireless uh, receivers, um, they'll have a huge mixing console. Um, uh, I mean, I remember I hired a utility person, a very young uh, kid uh, who hadn't, you know, worked on much of anything. Uh, he was in my shop and he was looking over um, some of my equipment that I had up on the shelves. It wasn't stuff we were taking. And he pointed to the seal of mixer and he said, what's that? And I said, well, that's the mixing panel. And he looks at it and he goes, well, what are those, are those, those knobs? Uh, he had literally, he had never even seen a rotary fader. And I said, well, those are the faders. He said, you mean like the, like the slide faders? I said, yeah, but those were rotary faders because we didn't have slide faders um, uh, except on really big studio consoles. Um, and he said, but I only see four faders. What if you had like six wireless out and you had to work a plant? Uh, and I said, six wireless? I said, when we were using this mixer, we couldn't find one wireless that would work properly. Uh, you know, so we were never faced with that. He said, did you do a lot of movies with that? I said, yeah, about 35 movies. Um, and he was just like amazed that something that simple could actually make a movie. Um, cut to today, where you have people using the big Yamaha board, you know, and they may have 10 or 11 wireless out there. Uh, they're having to worry about, you know, um, uh, frequency coordination. They're having to worry about the fact that every actor's got a mic on them, you know, and, and um, it's, uh, and then they have to mix all that because, um, certainly anybody working today, if they've had any experience, still understands the value of, uh, of the mix, you know, what, what, what now is called our mix track. Uh, in the old days, that was the only track. Uh, so you didn't have to call it the mix track because it wasn't the track. Um, and um, uh, I literally, since I've never done any episodic TV, uh, I don't even know how they do it. I mean, I always ask questions to people like Phil Palmer and Steve Thibault and, and uh, you know, Richard Lightstone and any of the rest of the people that are doing these uh, TV shows where every day they've got, you know, seven, eight, nine characters in a scene and they're shooting with two or three cameras and they're having to get some sort of a credible mix. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very honest with myself. I wouldn't be able to do it, you know. I've never learned how to do those things because I've never had to. Um, uh, even... Even big movies like The Last Samurai. I and mean, The Last Samurai was primarily one microphone, you know, on my, you know, Don Sufal's fishpole. You know, we use wireless for some things, but generally, but that's because it was shot in a traditional fashion. It was shot the same way a movie might have been shot, you know, 40 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, with a DP that didn't want to shower it with multiple cameras, with a director that didn't want to just like send the actors in and let's see what happens.